How about analysis of steel? Well, we, we talked about most of the steel evidence was destroyed via a decision by Richard Tomasetti, Charles Thornton's partner. But 236 samples were saved for testing, which is 0.3 percent. NIST did some tests on these samples. First, most important and informative test they did was something called a paint, paint deformation test, where they showed that despite pre-collapse exposure to fire, less than 2 percent of the samples showed temperatures above 480 degrees Fahrenheit. They did another test of steel microstructure, which showed that none of the steel samples reached the critical half strength value. Not as informative, but still. Good to know. That was uh, 600 degrees Celsius. Uh, I don't do the calculation in my head. Interesting NIST comments before and after these steel analysis uh, results. Before the steel temperature analysis, regions of fire impact, of impact and fire damage were emphasized in selection of the steel pieces. After steel temperature analysis, in their final report, they said none of the samples were from zones where high heating was predicted. The rat comes back. How about the laboratory tests? They did a couple uh, of important laboratory tests. Well, important that they did them not, not so well in, in terms of how they did them. They did tests uh, finally at the very end, slipped in a, uh, some results in September 2005, showing they had shot 15 rounds from a shotgun to prove that the fireproofing had been removed. They did some workstation burn tests, which focused on the gas temperatures, again, not steel temperatures, where they they actually doubled the average amount of, of hydrocarbon fuel being added. They used something they called overventilation, which is forcing oxygen into the fire zone. And they reached certain temperatures they were looking for, apparently. And then the, the laboratory test that uh, we talked about, the UL floor model tests, evaluated the pancake theory. The pancake theory, again, is something that was well described by a man named Carl Koch, whose father owned the company that erected the steel. He was a friend of Charles Thornton, and it goes back to that comment from Charles Thornton. He said, I could see it in my mind's eye. The fire burned until the steel was weakened and the floors above collapsed, starting a chain reaction of gravity, floor falling up, falling on floor. So the floors are falling down a stack of pancakes. That's what pan the pancake theory is. Okay, that's not the current theory, just to make that clear. So let's talk about the floor model tests a little bit. They used less fireproofing than was known to exist in World Trade Center 1. You may know that the fireproofing was being upgraded in all of World Trade Center 1. 18 floors, the 18 floors involved in the fire zones had been upgraded to twice as much fireproofing as was originally on there, and a new kind. They actually then reduced the fireproofing even further in their tests. They went from three quarter inch, which was present in most of the floors in the South Tower, and then down to half, a, half an inch for some other tests. They used what they called maximum load, which means they applied double the weight known to have been on the floors. They even say this in the report in a, in a different section. That they say we don't, you know, floors didn't collapse even though they had double the load. And they loaded all these concrete blocks on top of these floors, huge vats of water. You can see pictures in the report. It's just, it's really amazing. I believe that is part of the test, but still. Um, they, didn't, they should have talked about that a little more clearly. You can only find it in one small part of the report. They heated the floors according to ASTM E119 and looked for, as I said, the top of the floor to reach a certain temperature. I believe in this case it was 350 degrees Fahrenheit. They were looking for the, un, the unexposed, the, the surface that was not being exposed to fire. When it reached that temperature, they, sh they shut down the test. There was no floor collapse, and their clear comment is, the results established that this type of assembly was capable of sustaining a large gravity load, obviously, without collapsing for a substantial period of time relative to the duration of the fires in any given location on September 11th. Okay? Again, NIST comments before and after. Before the test, they said the test will determine the fire rating of typical World Trade Center floor systems under both as-built and specified conditions. After the floor test, they said the investigation team was cautious 
about using these results directly in the formulation of collapse hypotheses. And you can be sure they were cautious. <laughs> Finally, they did some computer simulations, and ultimately this is what they relied on. These computer simulations had input parameters that could be tweaked. On several occasions, realistic parameters were tossed in favor of more severe parameters. In fact, I believe throughout the entire computer model. Animations then were generated to compare with observed events. So they're going through this and they knew what they saw and they're trying to come up with a, an animation that shows that that's true, okay? These are some pictures I found on their website. I haven't actually seen their, their animations. I'm not sure they're available. My question is, does your future depend on these cartoons? <laughs> Ultimately, NIST's investigative practices were deceptive and unscientific. The documents needed just happened to be missing. Eyewitnesses to demolition characteristics were ignored. Physical tests that disproved predetermined conclusions were downplayed or ignored. The entire theory is built on fudged, inaccessible computer simulations. What is their final computer-based story? Seven steps. First two are not too problematic. The aircraft severed a number of columns. The loads were redistributed. The insulation, they don't like call it, calling it fireproofing. They like calling it insulation. was widely dislodged. High temperatures softened columns and floors. Some floors began to sag. Sagging floors pulled exterior columns inward, causing them to buckle and instability spread around the entire building before global collapse ensued. And I know it's painful and tedious to go through all this, but as I said, we really need to answer the falsehoods directly, point, point, point by point. So we're going to do that. So how many columns were severed? We know about the perimeter columns. We don't know about the, the core columns, but we'll take their word for it. And they say they were 14% in the North Tower and 15% of the columns in World Trade Center II, the South Tower. But if we go back to the original claim from the 60s, these buildings should have been able to withstand greater than 25% column loss, which is really an additional 30 columns or more before we have a problem, according to those design claims. How much load was redistributed? NIST says some loads were actually decreased and others were increased slightly. But again, the original design claims say that live loads on those perimeter columns particularly can be increased by 2,000% before failure occurs. These columns should have supported the extra load and much, much more. The live loads and the dead loads together create the entire load. They were, they were typically about the same. Okay, the dead loads were a little bit more, the live loads were slightly less than that. But if you can say the live loads have to be improved, can be increased by 2,000% with no problem, you're dwarfing the fact that, that there are even dead loads at all. So far, I have no reason to believe or suspect that collapse would occur. This is a key part of their argument, according to them. Uh, fireproofing was widely dislodged. And they say the towers would not have collapsed under the combined effects of aircraft impact and the subsequent multi-floor fires if the insulation had not been widely dislodged. So the buildings would still be standing there if the insulation had not been widely dislodged. Okay? Keep that in mind. So NIST must have done extensive testing to prove that the fireproofing was widely dislodged. No, they shot 15 rounds from a shotgun at non-representative samples in a plywood box. I wonder if they were in a hurry. There is no evidence that Boeing, a Boeing 767 would transform into so many shotgun blasts. Actually, many thousands would be needed. And we'll get to the fact that this actually disproved it. But I need picture number one, if you can do that. Ah, it's a little dark, but I don't know if you can see that. That's the plywood box. That's a flat steel plate with fireproofing sprayed on it. And there's a shotgun, really a shotgun. I'm not kidding you. Pointed at that. <laughs> It's not a column which has corners, which has edges, which has a backside with fireproofing on it. It's a flat plate. Can I have picture number two? 